Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble, and I'm excited to be here today with Lisa McEwen. We are going to be talking songwriting, and not just songwriting, but how we can really um, implement mindfulness into our songwriting and how mindfulness can actually help us be better writers. So I'm excited about this, especially because she spent some time in Nashville writing. And so I want to learn all about that and her experiences and what she took from that in order to help people now become better songwriters. So before we get into all that, Lisa, we'd love to know a little bit about your background, how you got into music, um, and you know what your journey has looked like until now. Hi, yeah, okay. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, so I'm Canadian, and uh, I was born in a town called Oakville, just outside of uh, Toronto. And I like to call myself the black sheep of the family because I think I kind of came out singing and no one else, no one else in my family plays anything, sings. Uh, the closest there is, is my grandma sang in the church choir. Uh, but my mom basically just didn't know what to do with me because I <laughs> sang nonstop. And uh, honestly, I have a family friend who's like, I remember your mom used to say, I just, she used to say to her, I just don't know what to do with her. She won't stop singing. Um, and eventually my parents got a piano, uh, put it in our living room or whatever, our dining living room area. And, um, cause my parents always loved music, just didn't know how to play. And so that was really cool because, you know, so I always loved singing and eventually as a kid, I'd sit down at the piano and just plunk away. And I realized, Hey, you know, if I put this, if I put my voice to music, I can kind of, you know, I look up to all these artists and I thought, okay, they're doing the songwriting thing. Maybe I can figure this out for myself, right? And put the singing with the music. So learn some piano. And as I got older, you know, I realized the piano is kind of hard to take around. So yeah, learn I'm guitar. a keyboard player, so I get it. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And, uh, I, but I still love piano, of course, but, um, I started, I started gravitating towards country music and because I was kind of paving my own path, like no one in my family sang and whatever, I was kind of always exploring different types of music. When I heard country, it was like, it just fit. It felt like home and my voice really suited it. So again, I was like, I better learn to play guitar. So, um, set out on that journey. And, uh, after high school decided that I was going to head off to college for music so I studied vocal, actually it was jazz-based vocal uh, at Humber College in Toronto. But I had a hard time uh, staying focused because all along I just kept thinking, I need to get to Nashville. Mm -hmm. I just need to get to Nashville. That's where my people are. I can feel it. Um, I'd taken a couple trips down to check out some songwriting, um, you know, workshops, right? Through NSAI, National Songwriters Association, and got connected with some people. And I just remember chomping at the bit like when can we wrap up this college thing because <laughs> I gotta get down to Nashville so uh finished that and thankfully my parents were supportive and my dad who loves old cars had a Volkswagen camper van and uh mm. he's like all right let's go so I loaded up my stuff like literally bare minimum stuff and my guitar and we crossed the border and found myself a place to stay and it did it felt like home it was one of those things where it was, it was terrifying and you're homesick and it's not like everything fell into my lap by any means. It was just that feeling of knowing this is the right place. Mm. This is where I need to be and just to have faith. So, uh, yeah, I ended up staying with some family friends and I just, I thought to myself, I'm going to do this. And it wasn't, so I always started as I'm going to be a singer. But when I realized there's this little songwriting component that people actually write songs for a living, 
they write for publishing companies and they write for other people. And that's how a lot of artists get their start. First, they're a hit writer. And then at the time, you know, record labels go, oh, they're also a great singer. Like, you know, let's, let's have them on our label. So that was kind of the plan I went, went into everything with. Um, and yeah, oh man, met some incredible people. Um, and just really cut my teeth, you know, like going out to open mics, waiting your turn in the smoky bars. Can, can just, I ask, how are you supporting yourself at this time? Okay. Well, this, this is controversial, but I had saved up a bunch of money, but being Canadian, you know, I just did some, th- you know, some, uh, side jobs, we'll call them because I didn't have a working visa. Right. So that was mm. another, another goal of mine. I had to get down there where I could be there doing things the right way. Right. You know, so there was a lot of pressure. I really put a lot of pressure on myself. Cause I was like, I am not going to go home. And mm. I even had my now husband, but my boyfriend was at home. And so I, I just, I had this like motivating push to like, I got to do it. I got to make it. And um, thankfully it was like retrospectively, it happened fast. But at the time, of course, it felt like, of course, slow as molasses. And I was like, will this ever happen? But it was um, 18 months and I was offered a publishing deal. And so that was awesome. Cause then I got, um, you know, work permit. I was making a little bit of money. And then I could concentrate on writing my songs during the day and going out to the shows at night. And I was doing some babysitting and things on the side, basically, to keep. Right. And so I know the people listening to this are going to be curious, like, how did you, what were the steps that you took to get that publishing deal? Okay. Yeah, for sure. So uh, truly a lot of it was putting myself out there. Like I say, going to those open mics because Nashville, especially is a big co-writing town. Mm -hmm. So when you're new there, you're like, Okay, well, where do I start? I mean, I really didn't have, I took a few trips, but I really didn't have any kind of like connections or, right. I mean, I know since then I've talked to people who would go down for a year. So they already had like a nice base of co-writers, right? And like connections. And I really didn't. So yeah, going out to a lot of those things, doing things like NSAI workshops, mm. right? They're so wonderful. And they would have these, I believe it was like every Tuesday there's these meetings and pitch to publisher meetings and you just go and you're talking to people and then you see the same people at different events and you're really creating that connection. So let me think how that all, you know, there's all kinds of different little things, but in a nutshell, that was it. It was like Nashville's a big place, but it's also, it feels like a small town. Mm -hmm. Everybody really knows each other. So like I say, when you would talk to somebody and, oh, hey, yeah, you, you should write with so-and-so. Okay, you don't say no. Right. I literally remember telling myself, uh, you remember the song, I Hope You Dance? Uh, yes. Okay, Leanne Womack. Love that song. Right. So I remember thinking, and again, you got to remember, I was young and I had all these emotions and, and you really want, it's like you want your life to be planned out for you so you can just stop stressing, but mm-hmm. that doesn't happen. I remember thinking, okay, if the line in that song says, if given the choice to sit it out or dance, I hope you dance. And I thought, I'm just going to say yes to everything. <laughs> Even if I'm terrified. If someone says, will you come play a show? You know, the part of me inside is like, oh, I don't know. Do I have good enough songs? Are they memorized? Are they all the reasons to not do it. I thought, I'm just going to say yes and I'll figure it out. And I started doing that. And I felt like that just opened up little doors. Right? So people would yeah. ask me to co-write. And even though I was terrified, <laughs> I would show up anyway. Right. It's so intimidating, right? Because you're like, oh, they're probably way better than me. I don't have a lot of experience. Totally. Which we'll get into later, but that's really, I mean, those sorts of things um, certainly like paralyzed me with fear. And that's what I, you know, this whole process of trying to get over. Um, But I did, I I co-wrote with some great people. And then, okay, the actual story of how I got my publishing deal was I was Googling one day, I'm sure, you know, different publishing companies. And I found this, pump, uh, or heard of a publishing company called Mura Music. And I guess I was gutsy because I just went on the website and I emailed, cold email, hey, I'm Lisa, da, 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 and I'd love to come play some songs for you. And normally those are always sent to the trash bin. Mm-hmm. But for some reason, I think the next day, the lady I'd sent it to, her name was Lisa as well. And I remember mm-hmm. thinking, oh, maybe she'll, who knows? We have the same name. Maybe she won't throw it in the junk folder. Um, she wrote back saying, 
you know, I'm not the person to play the songs to, but I forwarded your email to the right person. And that person got back to me, Dan wow. Hodges. And he said, uh, yeah, sure. Why don't you come and play me some songs? So I went in and back then, and I, you know, I had no money. I would just play my song, sing with my guitar. And, you know, I guess they liked what they heard and they saw potential. So they set me up with some of their writers and it didn't happen right away. Again, it was like, it's very much um, like, hey, how do you fit in? They're very mm -hmm. family feeling oriented, right? Like, are you a cool hang? You know, how do you write with our writers? It's very much a networking thing. Would you agree? Mm, yes. Oh, yeah. absolutely. So, uh, yeah, did, did lots of networking and stayed on their radar for a couple of months. And then they did offer me, uh, offer me a publishing deal eventually. So very cool. Yeah. It was pretty exciting. <laughs> okay. So once that happened, then what did life look like? So that was really cool because then it was like, oh, wow. Now, you know, songwriters, we battle with that. Am I good enough? If, you know, does everyone else think I'm good enough? And you're always, no matter, I kind of feel like no matter what titles you get, number one song or not, you're kind of always battling that, like, am I good enough type mm -hmm. of thing. So when someone takes you under their wing and says, you know what, we really believe in you and we're going to stand behind you, it gives you that little boost of confidence. So I remember thinking, this is so cool. I can go and meet people and say that I write for them. You know, and then they would help pay for the demos so I could really get my music sounding good. And I, you know, it was really cool. They were representing me. So I got to write with some incredible writers like um, Josh Keir and uh, Chris Tompkins. They had written at the time they wrote uh, Before He Cheats for Carrie Underwood. Mm. That was when I met them and was writing with them that hadn't even been put out yet. Like it was just on the cusp. Oh, gosh. That's such a brilliant song. I, I always think about that song like how the lyrics are just they just got it so right and they like the feeling of somebody who's been screwed over yes every girl <laughs> i think hears that and is like yes. yes i wish i wrote that yeah so people like that who are man like at the top of their game so you do you definitely feel that like oh i better i better step up to the plate kind of thing but it was definitely an exciting time because nervous and exciting time because mm -hmm. now you got to produce okay now you got to show them what you can do. I yeah. think. How, how long did you stay in Nashville and what, what did you, what else did you end up doing while you were there? Yeah. So, um, I ended up getting some, some nice indie cuts. I got, mm -hmm. you know, it was really exciting, you know, songs put on hold by some major artists like Tim McGraw was holding mm -hmm. it for a long time. And you're like, ah, I hope he cuts it. He didn't necessarily do that, but all of those things were just sort of like, okay, you're on the right track. Things were mm -hmm. going in a good direction. And then unfortunately our company was sold to a bigger company and um, was out of my deal at that point. So started looking around for new deals. <clears throat> and at the time met somebody who was doing some really cool shows at Falls View Casino, Niagara called Six Chicks. And they were, it was cool. We got to do our own original music and some covers with beautiful big stage professional band. Wow. So I was doing some shows with them. And during that time met someone and was signed to another publishing deal. Um, right Hook Music, Tom Lee's music, uh, Leslie DePiro, which Bob DePiro's wife. Got to hang with him and write with him. So yeah, some really cool, exciting things happened. And then I ended up, kind of a few different things happened, but I ended up moving home and starting a family. And mm -hmm. so a lot of those different, it's just interesting, you know, how the industry goes. It's like, you're hot one minute, you're not. It's, mm -hmm. You know, so I dealt with a lot of that, a lot of different changes, but definitely carried on making music, right? It was like up and downs and you're, you know, having babies. That's obviously very time consuming and where your heart goes, but yep. the music is always there. It's so interesting. No matter how hard I'm like, you know what? I don't need you. You break my heart music. You know, you don't, you're not paying off for me in the industry or whatever it is. As soon as you sit down, and you start playing. You're like, why did I ever turn my back? On I know so many times I tried to break up with music. Like when I, when I started having kids too, I'm like, nope, this is my thing now. I, I do kids. I don't do music. And after about a month, I was like, oh no, I can't just do this. I will yes. be so bored. I'm sorry. Well, listen, women are listening, right? I feel like a lot of people can relate. Um, I, yeah, I wrote a song actually couple years ago called I'm here now and I feel like you'll totally get it the idea was it's like I'm speaking to my music self saying mm -hmm. I'm sorry I turned my back on you but I'm here now because that is true breaking up with music I love that it's so true it's like this 
this crazy love hate relationship, right? Yep. Because we want it to be a certain thing, and hey, if it's not, then we're mad at it. And right. When really it's there to truly love us unconditionally and support us in all of these life endeavors. That's true. That's very true. And it's therapy. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes we forget that though, right? I yes. Mean, it, it, it just happens. Um, so yeah. And then, so over time, you know, my music evolved and I got really um, involved in stuff in Canada and, you know, Canadian country music awards, got to sing there with fellow Canadian artists and stuff. And, things just morphed and I started realizing that, you know, a lot of the things that I was, I kind of looked back and I thought, what kind of held me back from reaching my truest potential when I was in Nashville? I did well, but like, what, what was it that was really holding me back? And I realized a lot of it was that sort of like anxiety or that, that resistance, like we're kind of talking about now, like that sort of thing really, I really feel like helped held me back. Um, an example I like to use is this friend of mine. We were, we're friends now, but we were co-writing. We'd co-write maybe every couple weeks. And one day he said to me, hey, did you ever get that co-writing thing sorted out? Like, what is he talking about? And we got talking and I realized what he meant was like my crazy, anxious, nervous, walking into the room like, oh my God, if we don't get the best song today, he'll never want to write with me again mm. type of thing. You know, when you, you're like over, over and you're over producing, like not even letting the room breathe. Right. Cause you're just like, ah, we gotta, gotta get a great song. And when he hit, said that, I thought, oh, I'm so insulted. And then I thought, oh, he's so right. <laughs> Really and you probably that. thought that you were, this was all internal, like no one noticed and you were, you were covering it over pretty well, but it turns out. Exactly. Yeah. I was like, what is that? Oh, I really need to look into that. Um, and you know, that part of yourself that's like, you're not good enough. Mm -hmm. Your song now yeah, that why bother picking up the guitar? That's going to sound the same as the song before. And mm -hmm. who really cares? What, what's the point of doing music? If it's not, if you're not number one on the charts, mm -hmm. a lot of that, right? So yeah, and I bet that can get get really in your head when you work somewhere like Nashville because you are working with people that do have number one songs, right? Exactly. Yeah, you're constantly comparing yourself to these people who are at the top of their game, and you're thinking, if I'm not there, what's the point? Or you know, or I'm a nobody. Mm -hmm. That's not true at all. But definitely when you're in it, so it was like taking a step back and going, okay, I need to reevaluate. Why did I even start doing music? because I loved it. It made me feel good. And I wanted to connect with people. And then I started realizing, you know, how I've always loved mindfulness stuff, uh, personal development stuff. And I thought, how can I marry these two things? Because I know that over time, I got better with my music and my songwriting and, you know, networking in the industry, because I was doing these practices, like visualizing how things would go before I did them. Or just these little breathing techniques that are simple, but if we forget to do them, mm. we can definitely get off track. Um, you know, even going to different um, industry events, right? And you're kind of nervous. I remember thinking like, is everyone looking at me? I look like the the, the weird girl and, and, you know, you just get all in your head. Yeah, I always think like, oh, everybody else knows each other and I'm the only one that doesn't know anyone, <laughs> you know? Totally, yes, yes, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, so all of these little things, I started thinking, you know, I put these mindfulness things into practice. I bet there's other artists, songwriters, creatives out there that feel the same way and that could benefit from these sort of techniques and stuff. So, um, yeah, so I created my music and mindfulness business. So the idea of that is to help songwriters really tap inward there's all kinds of different elements to it, but um, essentially, like when I wrote that song I was referring to called I'm Here Now and I'm talking about not breaking up with my music or whatever, um, I was in this like meditative state. You know, you can call it whatever, like in the flow, in the zone, whatever you want to call it. Um, and there's a way to tap into that more efficiently and more consistently than just like, oh, I'll just wait until it strikes me. Mm -hmm. And so really helping songwriters to do that so they can be their most successful, whatever that might be for them. Right. And I'm curious, like, you know, a lot of songwriters are 
know, I need to wait for inspiration to strike or whatever. Do you, do you feel like these mindfulness practices help you be more in the, the zone of writing on a daily basis versus just like waiting for the universe? <laughs> for sure. Another thing I learned is that it's okay to not write every day because I mm. was writing every day in Nashville. Mm-hmm. And I remember even learning from great songwriters uh, and they'd say, yeah, I don't, I don't book myself every day. I need that day off to kind of do those things, gardening or whatever it is to kind of conjure up those cool ideas. But this is the thing. Yes. When you, even if you have say a deadline or you, um, you want to write every day, but you're like, oh, it's just not there. Well, at least when you tap in and you, you do these practices, you're going to get whatever it is that. You can call it whatever you want, source, universe, whatever, whatever they're trying to say through you, you can tap into it. And if it's no good, it doesn't matter. I think that's the difference. You're just doing it because it's, it's beautiful. It's enjoyable. And if it doesn't work, you're okay with that too, right? Cause there's such a difference than like, okay, I've got to beat myself up until I get the right thing on the piano. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's just like, there's, there's two different lanes. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and my experience, you know, I haven't really done mindfulness practices in relation to songwriting, but I do find that when I, when my mind is clear, like when I'm not trying to focus on it, I'm not trying to like conjure up something. I'm just doing, you know, I'm on a walk, I'm in the shower I'm whatever, somewhere where my mind is not having to focus on something else. That's when suddenly these ideas come to me. Exactly. That's your subconscious. Mm. And yeah, I talk about all this um, because I have a course with my uh, music and mindfulness uh, called The Successful Songwriter Within. But yeah, it's all about learning those different states. And when you are doing things subconsciously, yeah, like, you know, long uh, car rides, the shower, of course, everyone does talk about that, right? Or going on a walk. That's true. That's when it comes to you because it's almost like you're turning off that analytical mind or something Mm. um but the cool thing is you can do that uh there's all different ways to tap into it but you can also do that through simple meditations before you write Mm. uh, for example or during your write if you learn to you know there's brainwave states if you learn to tune into them it's pretty it's pretty amazing so i mean just give like a little little overview like what are kind of some of the the subjects that you cover inside of your course? So I have, yes. So there's a couple different modules. So I've got one, um, songwriting from the inside out. So we, I go over, like I said, the different brainwave states and how things work and then how to apply them. So I have different, um, actual visualizations that I walk people through, um, and meditations and just, they're not extraordinarily long. There's things that you can implement throughout your day Mm -hmm. or say before you start, co-writing um I also have things on co-writing because like I said that was a really big struggle and and still is it's still something that I need to like continue it's a practice just sort of getting out of your head and into the music and knowing that you're bringing your best self so different things like affirmations you know self-talk just talk to yourself nicely don't tell Mm -hmm. yourself that you're I constantly would be thinking in co-writes like man this person's gonna think I'm this they're gonna think think I'm that or I wonder what they're thinking of me now am I contributing enough and all this and we have the power to control the things that we're thinking and they really do make such a huge difference right if you can steer them in the right direction so things like that for me affirmations um and even just different audio things to reprogram your subconscious because your subconscious oh it drives a lot of what you do yep yeah so that and also um just different things too like gratitude, gratitude practices. I've also got a section there for connecting within the industry. Mm, okay. I think that's really, yeah. Things that are really going to help people connect those dots because it's one thing and not everyone mm. wants to do, you know, go into the industry. Sure. That's fine. But you know, a lot of people do, they're like, here's my music. Well, now what do I do with it? Mm-hmm. I really want this to be heard on some level. Uh, but what's holding them back is they're afraid to send that email or they're Mm -hmm. afraid to go on that call or you know what I mean? It's like they stop themselves before they even get a chance to start. Yeah. Of course I uncover things that I've done 
that have been really helpful to just get out of my own way and, and get those mm. things done. Yeah, I'm curious because I know writing for me, I, I'm sure you're familiar with Julia Cameron and morning pages and that yes. kind of thing. And, and for me, getting out of my own way and just writing whatever comes into my mind, even though it could be like the dumbest thing ever, that would get me into like the flow state. But how do you do that in a co-write? Because you're constantly thinking, I can't just give them any idea or like, it, you know, let myself flow to the point where I could be giving like absolute nonsense or like the dumbest thing ever. Cause yeah. you know, so how, how do you, how do you navigate that? Because yeah, sometimes that, the best ideas come out of that, but you had to go through a bunch of crap first to get there. Exactly. I, it's funny. And I love Lori McKenna. I've loved her for years. Mm. Oh, I used to go see her little clubs and mm. no one knew who she was. And Faith Hill would be sitting in the back and I'd be like, oh, this is the best. <laughs> um, and she always says that, you know, yeah, like they say dare to suck or, you know, you just say what's on your mind. And I remember thinking like, how do they do that? And I really think it comes down to two things. It's trusting the other person and trusting yourself. Mm -hmm. You have to have that relationship. And that's something that, you know, in Nashville, it's very much like, okay, get it on the calendar and sit down with a person and bang out a hit. And you haven't even, you don't even know them. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important that you do sort of develop that relationship, even if it's just spending that first hour talking and catching up um, and getting to know each other. And and when I say trusting yourself, because I really mean, you know, calming yourself enough to know that it's okay, take that hour, get to know each other, and to really be your best self going into that. When you have that sort of calm stillness and whatever, you can trust that the rest of that co-write is going to work out, even if you say those dumb things. Do you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. They're going to go, it's all, like, it takes time to get there, but... That is when the good stuff comes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I, I mean, I I have not actually done a co-write when I've been in the same space with a person. <laughs> and I think that'd be so much, so much more intimidating. I have done more like, okay, you know, someone sends me a voice memo of this melody that they came up with and I'm working on the lyrics or whatever. So I've I've never experienced that in the same space. And I can imagine it would be so intimidating. Yeah, it, it definitely can. That's funny too, because yeah, I enjoy that the type you're talking about, where it's like, okay, I could do it on my own time. No one's judging me. Um, but yeah, when you're sitting in a room with someone, you you do have to, um, you really just have to talk yourself through it and and try to relax. And like I said, that that's been a process for me. Um, and I even a friend of mine, co uh, yeah, co writer Victoria Banks, uh, who I've interviewed on my podcast as well, and she went on to say. She loved the process so much of making music, but realized that she was a deer in headlights and co-writes, mm. same as me, that she early, her early days in Nashville, she decided to go to therapy for it oh. and thought, you know what? I've got to figure this out because I love, I love my job. I don't want to change being a writer and co-writer. So I got to figure this out and, uh, yeah, used really similar techniques like self-talk, you know, you wouldn't talk to a child the way you're kind of berating yourself in your mm -hmm. mind. So just speak nicely to yourself, like, or ask yourself, what do I need? Do I need a break? You know, when you're in that room with someone and everyone's trying to get that next line and you can't do it, like maybe you need to take, go on a little walk, mm -hmm. take a breath, just whatever it is. Right. Yeah. Um, are, are you still currently co-writing or are you mostly just writing on your own? Um, I do a little bit of both. It's honestly just whatever time permits because I got three kids and I'm yep. doing the music and uh, doing music and mindfulness. But yeah, a little bit, a little bit of everything. Yeah. And, and I'm assuming during the pandemic, a lot of people that were used to co-writing in person had to co-write over Zoom. And I'm, I'm just, I've never done it before. Like, I'm curious how that changes the dynamic. Yeah. Okay. You haven't done it before. Interesting. Um, Not over Zoom. No. Yeah, so that was kind of the, you know, the neat thing that did come out of the pandemic is it's like, okay, well, we can't, like, for example, for me, it's like, okay, I can't get to, to Nashville as often as I'd like, so why don't we meet on Zoom? And um, it's different for sure. I mean, yeah, it doesn't, it's not the same as being in the room as someone, but it certainly is, it's uh, set, the next best thing because you're sitting there and you know what, like you say, you could even, I, I was working with someone who said, you know what, I'm just going to mute and I'm just going to mess around mm -hmm. and I'll, you know, in 10 minutes, we'll come back on. 
and see what we got. So oh, that's, that's kind of cool. cool too. Because in person, it's always like, okay, you're messing around on the guitar and so am I. And we're kind of, sometimes you need that. Clashing. Little... Yeah. And you can't focus Clashing. on what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. That is, that is a great way that Zoom could help. And also, like you said, it opens up more possibilities to co-write with more people that aren't in the same location. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I know on their time zone, maybe it works better for you at night and they're, you know, whatever their schedule is. Yeah. It can be really flexible that way. That's awesome. I love yeah. that. Well, is there anything we haven't covered yet that you wanted to be sure and mention to, you know, songwriters that are listening to this? Um, I don't think so. Just that, you know, if you're struggling with the same kind of things, or even if you just want to tap into that creativity uh, in a more of a smoother, easy way on a regular basis. Um, yeah, these mindfulness practices really, they really do help. And I feel like I kind of zone in on how they help the singer songwriter. So, um, yeah, we've had some people had some really good success with it. So that's awesome. Well, how can they connect with you? You mentioned you have a podcast, so how can they find that and how can they connect with you on social media? Sure. So, um, on my Instagram is lisa.mcewen.music and my podcast is called the successful songwriter within podcast I'm on Facebook, of course, under Lisa McEwen and my website for all my music and mindfulness is just musicandmindfulness.co. Yeah. And actually one more thing I wanted to mention that your uh, listeners might like is my song, because I'm a woman. Hmm. I did want to chat quickly about that because yes I okay so tell us what was the inspiration for that yeah so funny about that I wrote that uh, I was supposed to co-write with another female friend of mine that day and didn't quite have an idea ready or maybe I did and anyway I did a meditation that morning and the phrase because I'm a woman came to me because I had been listening to another podcast it's called um, the table women and it's about sort of two women in the music business, the country music business, sort of talking about the injustices of females versus males in oh, country music business. I should check that out. Really, really interesting. They interview all kinds of people. Yeah. So I had the phrase, because I'm a woman came to me and the thought was like, wow, wonderful things are, are on my side because I'm a woman. And there's also these frustrating things that are against me because I'm a woman. Mm -hmm. um, and then that, so I was supposed to co-write with a friend and she couldn't make it over zoom actually she ended up having to reschedule and i just thought I, this song won't leave me alone so mm. uh it just came to me and felt like a really powerful message to um to get across so just wanted to mention that too <laughs> love it and do you have that one is that released yeah and so i ended up releasing that when was that in the summer and i compiled a cool music video i took you know women who has inspired me and created a little music video you know all walks of life, mm. whatever they're doing, you know, not, you know, moms and career women and a friend of mine who beat cancer and she's in mm. it and all kinds of different things and just the strength that, that women everywhere have. So that's really awesome. Cool. So they can find that. Is that on your website? Uh, yeah. So that's, you know what? I didn't mention YouTube, but yeah, if everyone wants to search YouTube because I'm a woman, that's certainly on there and all my music and music videos and things like that. And I'm on all the different platforms for streaming music as well. So perfect. You can find that. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. This has been really great. And, um, I love talking about this because it's not, especially the co-writing thing. I don't have a ton of experience with it. And so I think it's, it's really helpful for those that are listening that do want to co-write more and want to be able to feel comfortable in their own songwriter skin when they're doing it. Absolutely. Yeah. If you ever need anything or want to ask me any questions or advice, I'm happy to chat about it. So yes, please reach out and connect with me. So thanks so much. Thanks, Bree. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to the Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. 
but I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.